Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Book and Author Society, our spring series. And I am Kathy Russ. I'm the president of the Book and Author Society. I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. And with me, um, and we are going to have a wonderful conversation with our author, is Katie Greer, who is our treasurer. Hey, Katie. Hello. And we are going to have a great conversation with our guest author, Bryn Turnbull, author of The Last Grand Duchess. So welcome, Bryn. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, we're going to have such a great conversation. But before we get into that, I always like to give a little introduction about the Book and Author Society to people who may be joining us for the first time. So the Book and Author Society is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to promote books and reading and authors and literacy. We used to, pre-pandemic, have two luncheons a year where we would bring in four to five authors who would give 15 minute talks and then we'd eat lunch and then there'd be a book signing. So the pandemic obviously has changed all that in that we've switched to virtual, but what's kind of really, I think a, a silver lining to all of that is now we get to have an in-depth conversation with one author and audience, just so you know, and especially in case you're joining us for the first time, we have left plenty of time to, for you to ask your questions of Bryn. We've disabled the chat feature, um, but you can ask your questions in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. It should be. And, um, and so we will, you know, feel free to type those questions in as we go throughout the evening. And about half an hour or so, we will, um, we will start to take those questions. And I need to mention that in addition to supporting books and authors and literacy, and reading. We also like to support independent booksellers and independent bookshops. So if, if, if you would like to purchase a copy of this book or any, um, any books, um, we hope that you'll visit our link at www.bookshop.org. And there's a copy that's just a link to that that's just been put into the chat. So, um, but we hope that you will purchase a copy of The Last Grand Duchess and Bryn very kindly has made book plates available to us. I don't know if you can see but they're really cool um, for The Last Grand Duchess. And so if you purchase a copy of the book from bookshop.org, we will send you a book plate. And so please um, please just keep that in mind and, and we hope that you will. It's such a good book. Oh my gosh. So with that, let's talk about it. Uh, so Bryn. Hi. <laughs> so there's so much to talk about and I wanna just dive right in and it's a two part question. The first is how did, you know, what made you decide to write about this chapter in history? And the second um, is, you know, we hear so much about Anastasia, you know, thank, thank you, Disney. Um, but what made you choose Olga? So go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, both both great questions. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks everybody in the audience for coming to join us tonight. This is just such a such a pleasure to be able to, to, to have this chat. Um, so where did the book come from? That is, uh, that's always the age old question with any book. Um, so for, for this book, I'd always been interested in the Romanovs. It had always been a story that had intrigued me. The last Romanovs, uh, the fall of the empire, you know, Rasputin, um, Alexei, you know, Anastasia, it, it all just was really, really interesting to me. But as you, as you very rightly pointed out, this story is so often told uh, through the perspective of, you know, Anastasia's pretenders, not even Anastasia, but her pretenders. And, or it's told through the point of view of Nicholas and Alexandra and their, um, uh, you know, the, the influence that Grigory Rasputin had over them. But to me, you know, both of those sides of the stories missed kind of a big chunk of the family, which was the daughters themselves. Uh, you know, you read about these daughters in the history books, and so often they're written about as kind of a monolithic entity. Uh, even in their own time, they referred to themselves as Otma, O-T-M-A, which was an amalgamation of their first names. And, and, you know, as sweet as that is, that that was, that they had this close bond, that kind of negated a whole aspect of who these people were individually. So when I started looking into kind of, you know, their individual stories, I realized that Olga in particular, you know, she wasn't a child when she died. She was 23 years old and she'd lived this really remarkable life, which included not only, um, you know, the, the balls and the parties and the things that we expect a grand duchess to, to inhabit, but also, you know, this whole chapter of her life, which was spent during the war where she was a Red Cross nurse. 
And, you know, she had these romances and she talks about them in her diaries. She refers to these different, you know, the, these different paramours by, by little nicknames. And, and so here was this young woman who had lived this life that was so much bigger than I think uh, I certainly had given her credit for uh, in, in my own readings of the family. And I, and I thought it was just such a remarkable story to be able to bring it to light. I um I really enjoyed Bryn how you do such a good job of so you for those who haven't read the book she, um you sort of alternate between um a couple different years in time each chapter kind of alternates between what happened prior to them uh being taken into custody I guess is a way to phrase it um and I loved the detail so you know you talk about how you used Olga's diaries which is fantastic that we have this primary source available to us. Um, and I loved like things like the fact that these girls slept on camp beds, you know, they're princesses, but they, they slept on camp beds. Um, and like Olga had dragonflies on her walls and th just these little details that really bring it to life. I loved that. And you feel the closing in as you read through the book, as it sort of, you know, everything is just gets very, we were talking before, um, before this about how we really wanted there to be a different ending, you know? Um, yeah. So it's, it's hard to read it at that point, but what, um, as you were constructing all of this and bringing all these details in, was there anything you really wished you could put in the book, but you, you weren't able to, or it oh, must've been difficult. <laughs> good question. Good question. You know, it, the, the Romanovs are the most documented family in history. So, you know, all of the details that I put in the book, that that all comes from these, you know, primary sources, secondary sources, uh, you know, the memoirs of their retainers, for example, uh, had a whole wealth of detail in them that uh, that was just absolutely irresistible to write about. And certainly, you know, those little details were amazing. But the one thing that I wish I could have put into the book was more about their time in Crimea. Um, because the family spent a lot of time on their uh, on Nicholas II's yacht, the Standard, uh, and not only in Crimea but also in Finland, they would go on these on these holidays. And so I'd envisioned this whole section of the book, which was going to take place during these you know th these holiday periods. But ultimately, I, I kind of moved away from that because I knew that I wanted the structure of the book to be set between this callback of where they are during the, you know, during their time in captivity and, and where they are beforehand. And I wanted there to be this call and response. So ultimately that didn't make it into the book, but I had these, you know, I had these whole scenes set where they're rollerblading on or roller skating rather on, on board the yacht and they're taking photos with their box brownie cameras, all this sort of, you know, all those details that make up a life. I mean, really and truly. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, it and that's one of the things I think that um, there's such atmosphere in this mm -hmm. book, because on the one hand, there's the, the chandeliers and the tea parties and the balls and the dancing, um, but there's the war. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes that part gets a little bit lost in the story of the Romanovs that, you know, that it wasn't just the Russian revolution, it was World War One as well. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, to, to find out that they, that Olga and Tatiana had been Red Cross nurses but, um, and then of course, you know, the end, the house of special purpose. And as Katie mentioned, the, the collapsing of the timeline, you know, it starts in 1914, 1913, and, or before that actually, but you know, when, when we really are in the heart of the story and then it just gets a little, it gets closer and closer, but the atmosphere to me, it just started to grow more ominous. And I guess yeah. what I, was that difficult to write or how do you capture that sort of overshadowing feeling of, of doom and still bring forth the personalities of the people. Yeah. You know, so one of the things that struck me when I was looking into Olga and when I was looking into the, the life that she lived, um, there's this moment that's reflected in a number of different kind of eyewitness accounts where Olga, once Rasputin is murdered, says, I understand why it had to happen. And that to me was such an insight into this character. And, you know, she, she had a lot of sort of a lot more political awareness than I think her sisters did. I mean, they were incredibly sheltered young women. And Olga saw what was happening and she saw kind of the fact that her parents maybe weren't leading Russia down the path that they had, that they certainly thought they were. Um, and that, and that this path was not going to end in a good place. And so 
the characterization when I, when I was writing the book, really what I thought about in terms of Olga was I almost wanted her to be a Cassandra figure where she could tell, she could see what was going to happen. She could start to see the writing that was on the wall earlier than the rest of her family. And this is very much, you know, this is very much a book about a young woman who realizes that her parents are not infallible and, you know, that the the political beliefs that they hold are not necessarily her own. Uh, she was known for being an incredibly compassionate young woman and, and incredibly um, conscientious. So, so kind of all of that co- combined for me. And, and, and I wanted to be sure that I wasn't um, lionizing Nicholas and Alexandra. And I, I was not trying to look at them from the perspective of, uh, of them as saints, which, I mean, they are, you know, they, they were canonized in the Russian Orthodox Church, but that was not the perspective I wanted to look at this family from. I didn't want to look at them as saints. I didn't want to look at them as you know, as completely horrible figures, I wanted to look at them as a, as a family, first and foremost, and, and from the perspective of a daughter, who's realizing, you know, maybe these, maybe these aren't the people that I thought they were. I think you did such a good job of that, too, like, just constructing this beautiful family that clearly they care so much about each other. Um, and the parents care so much for their children maybe a little too much because we were, you know, talking before the, before we started and it's like, there's so many little tiny tragedies in the decisions that were made to keep them so sheltered or to, you know, keep them away from uh, people most of the time. And maybe things could have turned out differently, but I love how you, how you create the relationship, the family, because you really get that closeness, which is so uh, different from what we hear about in other Royal families. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, you compare them to, you know, for instance, Victoria's family. Yeah. Right. And it's a completely different dynamic, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, um, any royal family and anywhere. I think, you know, you just don't hear about, you know, them vacationing together and sitting together and reading and needle pointing and, and have and playing together mm-hmm. and not separated by governesses or, or what have you. No, part of that, yeah. too, was to protect. Um, the youngest uh, who had hemophilia and I'm blanking yeah. on his name right now because it's been a very long, thank you, Alexi. <laughs> um, so Alexi, now I, there had to have been obviously rumors and it seems like they did a fairly good job protecting the knowledge of his disease. Um, do you think it was more understood than they thought at least? Cause they seem to think that they were doing a good job of protecting him, protecting knowledge. Well, I mean, I think that if, I, I think that if they had, done a poor job of protecting the knowledge Gregory Rasputin and the, and the influence that he had over the family would not have become so popularly malevolent mm-hmm. as it did. Um, I think people knew that there was something wrong with the Tsarevich, but they didn't know exactly what it was. And they certainly didn't realize that this was a, a, a horrible, horrible disease that meant that he was not likely to make it to adulthood. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, one of the biggest tragedies about all of this beyond the, the fact that he was diagnosed with hemophilia itself, which is so unbelievably tragic, but the, big, the, the, the other tragedy was they had these four daughters and none of them were eligible for the line of succession. And if there had been some, you know, if, if they had been able to change the laws at one point, they actually were looking into having the laws changed so that Olga could be named um, successor to Alexei if the worst were, should, were, you know, were to happen. And you look at it and go, gosh, if that had been the case, there wouldn't have been this additional stress. There wouldn't have been this additional you know, level of, of paranoia really over, over their son and, and, and his fate, because they weren't just looking at him as a child, they were looking at him also as the, you know, the future of, of Russia itself. Well, in the end of the Romanov dynasty, right? If if he had not inherited, or if he well, he didn't, but um, but if he had died, I mean, that would have been the end, and it would have the the um, it would have gone to a cousin. And so- yeah, well, it actually did. After Nicholas abdicated on behalf of himself and of Alexei, um, the the crown, I think it went to Grand Duke Mik- uh, Mikhail. Mm-hmm. And he turned it down. He didn't want anything to do with it because basically the revolution had already begun at that. Well, it had already begun at that point. And he saw the, he saw the crown for the poison chalice, which it was at that point. 
it was, it was, it, the story always makes me sad because um, it's like, I don't know, three, 500 years of chickens coming home to roost on this poor family, you know, and although they, I mean, Nicholas and Alexander were certainly not blameless. And one of the, um, they just seemed so much more suited to, you know, as, as it was sort of referenced at the end, the country life or, you know, just not being emperor and empress and, you know, would have been happy, but um, Nicholas, just the most ineffectual man. And I think, you know, even whatever impulse or instinct he had to maybe do things differently or give more power to the Duma, just overridden by Alexandra. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And I mean, that is, theirs was very much a love match. And, And we know that it was a love match, but it was a love match that was politically disastrous because Alexandra really wanted nothing to do with the position of, of Empress. She was not social. She didn't really, she didn't really learn the language even. She wasn't very interested in making friends. And, you know, and, and so she, she didn't have that connection with the people that would have maybe helped Nicholas, um, you know, if, if he'd married someone else. It reminded me a little bit um, because I've read some about the French Revolution, a little bit about Marie Antoinette because she was Austrian and the French people did not like her one bit and blamed her for so much of what was going on. And then, of course, France went to war with Austria and that was the end Isn't of that. Isn't it always and, the case that it seems to be a woman's fault? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Honestly, that struck me. I was like, why? I don't know. Always a woman's fault somehow. <laughs> Yeah, Nicholas is off the hook because Alexandra's German and she didn't like to go out and press the flesh and, you know, go out on the balcony and do the wave. Yeah, ne- yeah. leaving aside the fact that he was completely ineffectual as, as a ruler himself and he made terrible decisions, right? But no, it's Alexandra's fault. It's just all Alexandra. We cut the woman a little tiny teensy sliver of slack. <laughs> Although she is the one who brought Rasputin in. And I, I appreciate very much that you didn't make Rasputin the super focal point of the book. I mean, he was in it. He has to it be in too. it. Yeah. But it wasn't all about Rasputin because we get a lot of that too in history. And yeah. did you, I mean, in your research, um, did you find out anything about him that was unusual or took you by surprise? Well, I mean, it was very important to me that I didn't want him to be like the mustache twirling villain of the story because I mean, I think that having a mustache twirling villain really in any story is a bit of, you know, it it kind of negates the reality of who these people were. I mean, Rasputin was absolutely not a good guy, right? He was, he was a drunk. He was lecherous. He took advantage of women. He was not puppet. He was not the puppet master behind Nicholas and Alexandra by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I read a biography of him, which came out, I want to say in 2016. And it talks about kind of what his philosophies, you know, his religious philosophies were. And they were all actually pretty standard. It was take care of the poor, you know, protect the vulnerable in society. And, and so, you know, what he was saying to Nicholas and Alexandra, I don't think was really outside the realm of what any you know, holy advisor would have been saying, it was just this other side of him, this, you know, this, the personal side of his life, which he kept very separate from Nicholas and Alexandra that, that caused such, uh, such chaos. Yeah. I will say one figure that is also sort of on the sidelines through, through the book, through the war part of the book, um, Dr. Gedroy, am I pronouncing it? I yeah. wish, I almost wish it made sense to bring her in more because she was a fascinating person. Like, what, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you have lots of research on her that you would have loved to have bring in. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I think Dr. Gedroy, it's, what a, what a remarkable character. I mean, you know, for anybody on the call who, who maybe hasn't read the book, Dr. Gedroy, Dr. Vera Gedroy, she was, uh, they, they were a princess. I refer to them as they because they presented as male throughout their life. They referred to themselves using male pronouns, you know. So in the in the language of the book, in the language of Olga, Olga wouldn't have had the language to to kind of call them a they or a he. But they were this incredibly remarkable person who, you know, 
reached the highest echelons of med, uh, you know, of the medical world in Russia. They were the, you know, they they presented as male. They wore male clothing. Nobody batted an eye, including the emperor and empress. Uh, they were the imperial physician. They were like like to the children. And also they were this incredibly badass military surgeon. So, you know, there, there's this scene that I have in the book with Dr. Gedroitz where they um, they tell Rasputin off. And I'm, I'm just going to say, it's this one scene where they tell Rasputin off and it, I, I just knew I had to have that scene in the book because I just admire this person so much and what they it was, accomplished. It was a great clash of personalities. It really was. <laughs> Oh yeah. And it was, you know, I just like, I felt like I was on fire when I was writing it. I just, I loved kind of being able to put that in there, but yeah, I hope somebody writes a book about, about this person, because I mean, what a remarkable historical figure. Yeah. So I want to get back, um, if we can, to the, to the, um, to the daughter. So we talked about, um, Mm -hmm. Olga a little bit, but, um, and you, you had said that she was known for being compassionate and, um, but in the author's note, you mentioned that she and Tatiana, um, I guess, you know, for their age and because, well, they were, that they were immature. Mm-hmm. And do you feel like she grew up? I mean, I think she certainly did in your book, but in, in, um, in the historical record, you know, was there an evolution there? Um, and, and if you could talk to about the personalities of the other daughters, because I think they get you know, they do kind of fall in Anastasia's shadow a little bit sometime. And um, yeah, based on your research, I mean, I, I'm assuming based on your research, you brought those personalities, those are true to the, to the record, but like, you know, Marie, who was taking care of everybody and Tatiana, who was kind of that, she reminded me of Emily Bronte a little bit, just get it done, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Tatiana was a, you know, she was a force to be reckoned with really. The sisters all called her the governess because, She was the one that like, you know, if something needed to get done, Tatiana was going to do it. And she actually was a remarkably good nurse, Um, you know, in in all of the historical records. I believe uh, even Dr. Gedroitz references how skilled Tatiana was as a nurse, whereas Olga had, you know, Olga wanted to help. Uh, She wanted to be there, but she she found it a lot more um, emotionally draining, I think, than than Tatiana did. Um, and Tatiana, like Olga had these romances, right? She had this, you know, she had this big life because she was, you know, she was an adult and, but, but, you know, both of them were quite, you know, by our standards, certainly they, they would be considered very immature and by the standards of other, you know, other Royal women of the time, certainly they were very immature. Uh, they weren't being kind of trotted out to, you know, to meet other people, their age, they weren't really socializing with a peer group. They were socializing with their siblings and with the Tsar's guard. And so a lot of their romances are these, you know, these young officers who make up the father's, you know, their, their father's retinue. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tatiana, I just, I adored. Maria is this really interesting character because she's dismissed by the family quite frequently. And, and she does very much, present as in Anastasia's shadow. Anastasia was this absolute fire plug. Um, you know, I referenced this, this scene in the book where Anastasia's trying to breed like a super intelligent race of worms and that happened. And, you know, she was kind of the selfie queen. Oh yeah, no, that, that actually did happen. And, and so, and, and she was a prankster, right? She was this, you know, gregarious personality and Marie was quiet and demure and, and very ladylike and strikingly, strikingly beautiful. Although the family all called her Fat Marie. Yes. Um, they all, cause she, she was she was more curvy than the other girls. And so they all thought that she was, you know she was kind of the chubby one despite the fact that she was just this luminously beautiful young woman. Uh, and she she was apparently incredibly kind and incredibly just, just gentle. At one point she stole cookies from Nicholas's plate at dinner when he was looking the other way. And his reaction was to turn around and say, oh, well, thank heavens. I was starting to think that she was about to sprout wings out of her back because she was so perfect. I'm glad to know that she can, you know, I'm glad to know that she can, you know, be a bit mischievous. But um, Louis Mountbatten, the uh, uh, Lord of the Admiralty, 
uh, up until he died in the 1970s, uh, he was assassinated by the IRA. But up until he died, he had a photo of Marie on his bedside table because he was so in love with her as a young man. And she was such she was such this just lovely, lovely young woman that uh, he always kept this photo of her by his bedside to remember her. And why didn't why didn't Nicholas? I, I know Prince um, Prince Carol of Romania. I think you mentioned this in the author's note as well. Like made an offer for Marie or Maria, and he, yeah. you know, um, what was the resistance to marrying to having the daughters marry? So I mean, the the, the biggest resistance was the fact that it would have been kind of it would have been quite callous on Nicholas's part to marry off the third daughter when the first two were not yet engaged. So that was, that was really kind of the big reticence on Nicholas's part, but also Nicholas, Marie was his favorite and, and she was 16 years old and he was not ready to have her be married off. But also, you know, Prince Carol was not a particularly um, likable guy. Uh, and and go on his Wikipedia page and and look look at him later in life because he he was he had he had quite a career later in life he had a whole cult of personality going on in in Romania but you know it does open up one of those really interesting what if moments in history because what if Nicholas had said yes Marie you you know you can marry Carol she goes off to Romania and when the revolution happens there's a Romanov still alive. And there's a Romanov not only alive, but a Romanov who is, you know, about to be head of state of another of another country. Uh, I think it would have I think it would have drastically changed at, at the very least. I think that the family would have gotten out if not, uh, you know, the white army would have had somebody to rally around sort of that rallying point. It was so I mean, it is it is very much a what if moment of history. I think there I think that's one of the things that for me makes this story so sad because I think that there are so many what if moments, you know, if, if, if Nicholas had started paying attention a little sooner, if Alexandra hadn't really fallen for Rasputin's line, if Alexei hadn't had hemophilia, if, if any of the daughters, I was even thinking if, if Olga and I, and I do want to talk about this as far as her romances and if they were fictional for the book or, you know, I, um, but like, even if she had married, um, one of her love interests and been a, you know, wife of a soldier, would that have changed because it changed the feeling of the Russian people towards the, the Royal family, even, you know, apparently being Red Cross nurses didn't, didn't help them in the end. So, you know, just like, no, I'm one of you, I'm married to a soldier, you know, if that would have made a difference, but, um, but can you talk about some of the real life romances that they had? Yeah, I can, you know, the, the romances were a real surprise to me. I have to say when I was, when I was reading, when I was researching these, these young women, it surprised me that they were able to pursue these romances. And I think that the, the conditions of war were kind of what broke down those barriers for, for both of the for both Olga and Tatiana. Um, you know, Olga has this, this, this early romance with Pavel Voronov, who was uh, an ensign uh, and part of her father's Navy, I believe. And he, you know, it, it was this lovely courtship and he was this, you know, by all accounts, just a lovely young man, but he knew that it wasn't ever going to go anywhere because how could it, uh, you know, she's the, she's the czar's daughter and, and, and Olga very much in her diaries, she, she speaks about him with this like breathless first love puppy love crush kind of energy. Um, and, and you know, when he, when he ultimately marries, I think that was that, that, that in my reading and in my interpretation of Olga was this very kind of seminal moment for her where she realizes that, you know, her life is not necessarily, it, it's not like other girls, right? Her life is not going to be the same as someone who can be a soldier's wife. And she, she has to, you know, she has to figure out a way to reconcile the personal side of her her heart and and the the duty that she has to to Russia to you know to to make a dynastic marriage one of the things that I found really impressive about her though 
was she exacted a promise from her father uh, when she was a teenager that she would never have to marry for duty. She would be able to marry for love, which I think is such a, a remarkable thing in this day and age where women really were used as political pawns. So yeah, for Olga to be able to, you, you know, for her to be able to say to her father, this is what I want, this is who I am. And for him to respect that, I think was really, really quite remarkable. I mean, I don't think that he ever dreamed that she would end up with a, you know, with a lowly ensign or a, you know, a Dmitry Shakhbagov, the, you know, the Grenadier Guard. But I do think that he, he recognized Olga's need for that autonomy for herself. Um, you know, and then, and then going into Mitya, uh, you know, Mitya, the relationship that she has with Mitya, it took, it, 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 it was real. It, it did happen. Um, you know, they were very much, she, she, those diary entries read differently from the ones about Pavel and they read more emotionally and more, you know, with, with more gravitas. And, and again, you know, the war I think would have broken down those barriers between them because is this the same world that's going to come out the other side? Are the distinctions going to matter as much as they, as they do, or as much as they did in the before, you know, before 1914, um, so I think that there was a little more hope there. I, I, I did fictionalize the end of the story, I will say, um, because we don't know what happened to Mitya. We have no, no record of it. There, there's a record of a Shak Bagov, which was his last name. There's a record of a Shak Bagov in, I think it was 1923, heading up a division of the white guards uh, or of the white army in the Caucasus. Um, when, you know, when the revolution, you know, when the Russian war was ongoing, but we don't know whether that was him. And for me, I just, I, I wanted so badly for him to, to have survived. And I wanted there to be that, you know, I wanted there to be some hope there at the end. So I won't, I won't I say any more than that. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> I wanted it to be him because the white army was, um, weren't they more pro monarchy? And so I was like, maybe he's trying to find her. Yeah, they they were so the white army was fighting to restore the monarchy, and the red army was the revolutionaries. Uh, yeah, who were headed up by Vladimir Lenin. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's see. I think we have a couple of questions. So if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to put them in the Q and A because um, we, I'm Katie, and I are happy to ask them on your behalf. And um, so we'll see. We will see what some of the questions are. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question before we get to the questions. It's about the time in captivity um, when they were uh, under lock and key. And I didn't realize they had been sort of shuttled around to a couple different places when they were. Um, there's this there's this lovely story about how they built a huge snow fort. Is that I assume that's built based on real reality and that happened and. Yeah, it is. And you can see the photos, actually. You can look them oh, up cool. online. Uh, you know, the internet, I, I have to say, I was planning to travel to Russia uh, when I was researching the book and the pandemic, you know, shut everything down literally about a month before I was set to go. And so this whole book was done online. And like I said, you know, the Romanovs are the most documented family in, in history. So you can find so much. You can find these family photos of them. You can find these, you know, images and diaries and excerpts and everything. And, and it's it's so amazing to see kind of how all of that comes online. So yes, there are photos of Snow Mountain. You can find them. It was just, it was such a nice way of showing how they still tried to have a life and to have some joy and a little bit of hope, you know, under these bleak conditions. It was really quite sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Or, <clears throat> excuse me, before we get into the questions, I have one more too, which is, um, so reading Olga's diary, how, well, how long is it? And did you, I mean, because I think there's just something to, to hearing the person speaking in their own words. Um, mm -hmm. So when you read it, I mean, had it been a thought like, oh, maybe I'll write about Olga. And then you read her diary and thought, yes, I'm going to write about Olga. Or how did, how did that diary reading affect you? Yeah. Well, I knew, I knew Olga was going to be my main character before I found her diaries, because I had heard this nugget of thought, which was, I understand why Rasputin had to be killed. And so that for me was the, my entry point into the character, whether I'd found the diaries or not, but the diaries were translated by uh, an academic named Helen Azar. And she went through and she, I think actually she's, she's done the whole family. She's translated the whole family's diaries. And 
they do give a completely different side of Olga because so much of it is, you know, so much of it is, of, of the documentation is secondhand. And it's also, you know, it's also, it's the things that historians find important, which is, you know, she was here on this date. She was there on that date. She went with her father to the theater on this date. In Olga's diaries, she's talking about all that. You know that she's writing it a little bit for posterity, but she's also including these details, such as the ones about the, you know, the the romances that she's having and the, the crushes that she has. And, you know, how Anastasia is being such a brat and mom, you know, mom's got another headache and it's a three on the four scale pain factor that she's come up with herself. And I can't believe that I have to do another duty that should be mom's. And, and so there's all of these different kind of, and, and she also, she, like, she talks about skinny dipping in Crimea, you know? And, and so it's, it's these things that you think, oh my gosh, this was, yeah, this was a, this was a, you know, teenager, a young woman living the life of, of a young woman when so much of what we think about her is, you know, this picture of her in the giant tiara and this, you know, bedecked in the jewels and, and, you know, almost like, like armor shielding who she actually was from, from people. So yeah, the diaries were real. I, I was really, really fortunate to find those. And I, I do. I mean, I think it just, it, it hits you because you say they, they, these are real people. I mean, they're not just, I think, what did you call them? The, the, the paper princess or the, um, the, Oh the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. From far away. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, real people, I mean, as real as we are and, and living different lives to be sure, but the feelings are still the same, you know, the wanting to love and be loved and, you know, my mom's bugging me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we've got, um, we've got a couple of questions. So this one is from Laura. Um, she says, I haven't read the book yet. Um, and, and, um, but she wanted to know if the girls had, um, any marriage proposals that would have taken them away from the situation, maybe to someplace safer. Yeah. Well, uh, hi, Laura. Thanks for your question. Um, so yes, uh, Maria certainly had the, had the one marriage proposal. The other daughters didn't, um, you know, Olga, there, there've been a couple people kind of bandied around. Prince Carol was one of them. Dmitry Pavlovich was another, and he's, he's a, he's a very prominent secondary character in my book. Um, and, and really the reason for it was the, the diagnosis of hemophilia was not known to the average Russian, but it was very well known within the royal circles, uh, you know, within the other royal families, because, you know, it had come down through Victoria. Victoria had 13 children. Those 13 children went all over Russia to all different imperial families and the hemophilia followed them. So people knew what, you know, other imperial families knew what was afflicting Alexei. And they knew enough about hemophilia at the time to know that it was carried through women. Uh, women are the carriers, men exhibit uh, the symptoms. And so they were kind of seen as, as a little bit radioactive. Um, nobody wanted to bring hemophilia into their bloodline um, and if, if it hadn't already been brought in. So they, so, so you know, and, and Olga, uh, this is a theme in the book, Olga does recognize the fact that she's not getting those proposals and, and making those matches the way that, you know, say another, another princess of the time would have been, would have been making. So we have a question from Sarah and she wants to know if you're interested in writing about other historical figures. Hi, Sarah. Uh, yes, absolutely. I love writing the stories of women who kind of been peripheral to, but overshadowed by major historical events, events. So my first book, The Woman Before Wallace is about Telma Furness, who was the mistress to the Prince of Wales in the 1930s and best friends with Wallace Simpson, um, who ultimately supplanted her as Edward's mistress and then wife. And, and so for me, you know, I, I love writing those kind of biographical historical stories and finding the stories of these women who are kind of like caught between the cracks of the historical record. I think so much of, you know, so much of history has been written by men, uh, you know, for so much of our time and, and men, men's stories have taken precedence in the historical record. And so for a historical fiction writer, we've got this amazing opportunity 
to pull those women's stories out and, and find them again. And, and so I love being able to do that. I love being able to find these historical women and, and tell their stories. Do you have one set in your sights for the next book yet? Or I do actually, the third book is it's my first book where I've got two completely fictional characters as the main, uh, as the main protagonists, but it is set in a museum in occupied France during the second world war during, uh, during the occupation. And there are, there's a very, very well-known historical woman who is uh, very, very much there and very much part of the events. It was interesting though. She didn't speak to me directly. So I didn't think she, she didn't want me to tell her story myself. <laughs> That's exciting. When is that? Uh, what's the timeline for that? Uh, so I'm finishing it up. My deadline's in May. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, I think it's, it's slated to come out next year. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Well, you've had such, um, cause the woman before Wallace was your first book, correct? Yes, it was. And, and that got such a great response. And I actually wanted to, um, I'm, I have not read it, but it's next on my list because I just finished, um, Vanderbilt by Anderson Cooper. Yes. And Talma is Gloria Vanderbilt of Gloria Vanderbilt jeans, her, her aunt. Yes. Um, yes. and I had heard about Talma Furness, but I never linked her with Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt, but they were what the marvelous Morgan sisters. They were the, Mar- they were the marvelous, more magnificent Morgans. Magnificent Morgans. Yeah. yeah so, twin sisters. And just gorgeous. And, and it's, it's just so interesting how, how history is not in a vacuum. I mean, everything is linked. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, in Talma's story, so she's, you know, just to give kind of a quick, quick summary she's she's very much involved with the british royal family through edward her sister gloria morgan is a vander she marries into the vanderbilt family and so tom was kind of caught between these two kind of royal storylines british and american royalty and and i was amazed that nobody had had written her story on its own merits people had written about the vanderbilts they'd written about you know the custody battle that is is quite central to this book They'd written about the abdication crisis, but Telma kind of slipped through, you know, cause she was a footnote in all of those stories. And I thought, wait a minute, this is an incredibly interesting woman who's never been kind of seen on her own merits. So let's see, we'll go back to the question. So Laura has another question. Um, she wants to know if there's any ex- surviving extended family of the Romanovs, um, Nicholas or Alexandra. Yeah, actually, there there are quite a lot of extended Romanovs still uh, still around. The extended family, most of them got out of Russia um, during the revolution. Uh, Not all of them. Um, Alexandra's sister, for example, who was married to Grand Duke Sergei, she she was assassinated. Um, But Nicholas's sisters, Olga and Xenia, got out, as did the Dowager Empress Maria. And Xenia ended up in the UK. Her daughter uh, is her daughter is also named Olga, and she is uh, yeah she's she's still alive, and she's done a number of of sort of documentaries on on the Romanovs, and then Olga, um, who is a secondary character in the book. Um, this is my character Olga's aunt, Aunt Olga. She actually ended up in Canada, which is where I live. Um, she ended up outside of on uh, just outside of Toronto on a farm in Campbell Ford, Ontario, and she lived out the rest of her life here. Uh, and she actually ended up the very final years of her life. She ended up in Toronto in an apartment above a storefront on Girard Street. And so I remember hearing as a child about this Grand Duchess who lived in Toronto, who lived kind of down the street. And it was always so interesting to me that this woman had had kind of ended up in in Toronto. So that Canadian connection was one that that really kind of drew me into the Romanov story. Can you imagine, I mean, her life from beginning to end to start out and have the memories of the balls and the tea parties and the dancing mm-hmm. and the jewels. And then to, I, I, do you know why she came to Canada over say the UK? Not quite sure what brought her to Canada specifically. Um, I, that, that absolutely would be something worth looking into, but I do remember like my grandfather's, uh, my grandparents had friends who would go to her house and she would show them like all of her icons and all of the kind of religious, like all of this paraphernalia that she had, all of these, you know, 
relics of, of her time as a, as a grand duchess. And Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Katie. Oh, no, I was just that you sort of allude uh, to the fact that she was very bothered by a bunch of people claiming to be her long lost relatives, especially Anastasia. Um, how many people have claimed to be Anastasia or the various sisters over the years? Do, do, do you have a number? <laughs> I don't have a number. A lot. Um, there were a lot of pretenders. And the reason most of them uh, purported to be Anastasia was because she was the youngest and so, and she was, I believe she was 16 years old when she died. And as a result, her features hadn't kind of settled. And so people could say, oh, well, she's, you know, I've got the same color eyes. Let's see what, what I can do. Anna, Anna, uh, Anna Anderson is the most well-known of the, um, you know, of the pretenders, but unfortunately, uh, you know, it, the, the, the proof is undeniable. The evidence has all been found and they, sadly, they all did, they all did perish. Sorry, my, my puppy just knocked something over. <laughs> <laughs> we always like special guests. <laughs> well, and I think, I, I don't know if this is, I think it's related, but there was a show, I think it was on Netflix called The Romanovs. And wasn't it fiction stories about people who were related to, I didn't watch it. I thought about watching it, but I never got around to it. Yeah, there, there was, uh, I think it's on Amazon Prime. Uh, oh. Yeah, and, and it's these stories of like, relations who like there was sort of a Romanov diaspora after after the revolution and it's it's stories about the different you know different fictional I believe they're all fictional descendants okay. but it's a it's an interesting it's a really interesting story yeah yeah I'm I think the pandemic sort of knocked that out of my head but I should go back to it because especially yeah. a, you know after reading a book like yours it makes me want to dive into Olga's diary it makes me want to learn more and read more um yeah. just so maybe I'll start there yeah. um there's another question are there any patients that um that Olga and Tatiana tended to sir, while serving in the Red Cross that remember them did anybody write about them in that way that's that's a great question. I found a couple sources, not too many. Um, the hospital that they sorry, my dog is literally biting my hand. Uh, <laughs> uh, they the hospital that they nursed in was quite small. It was an officer's hospital with about twenty beds, uh, so it, it was it was quite small. But there are a couple people who who do remember them nursing. Um, Dmitri Malama is one of them. He was a love interest of Tatiana's. Um, and he, he features in the book as well, but yeah. One thing that you've mentioned, um, is to the connections to the other Royal families. Um, you know, certainly the, the, um, Royal family in England and, you know, the hemophilia came through Queen Victoria. One of the things I always find shocking is that, um, you know, I, I, was it George or an Edward? I think it was a George in England didn't really do anything to help them. Um, yeah. And of course, Kaiser William was a cousin too, but they didn't particularly care for him. And then Germany and Russia were at war. Um, but why didn't, why didn't the Royal family in England try to do more to help get them out? You know, that's such a, that, that is such a tragedy of the time. But what we have to remember is that revolutionary sentiment was not um, specific to Russia. It was throughout Europe and spreading, um, particularly in the UK, we have the Irish example. Uh, the IRA was, was becoming, I, actually, I don't believe it was the IRA at the time, but um, you know, the, the, the Irish independence movement was becoming quite well known. And a lot of people in Ireland felt that, you know, the revolution that's happening in Russia, we could do that here, depose the monarchs and end up with a free Ireland. And so the, the popular belief with the UK was that George V's chief of staff was the one who made the decision not to bring the Romanovs over. But recently um, papers were found that show that it was George himself that made that decision. Wow. And he'd initially offered asylum. He and Nicholas were incredibly close. Um, you know, they, they, they truly did love each other, um, almost like brothers. And it, it certainly haunted George to the end of his days that he had to revoke that, that offer of asylum. But the worry was if they were to bring the, the Romanovs over, that would spark the flame uh, that was already kind of smoldering, uh, that would spark the flame of revolution in, uh, in England. 
Wow. Mm -hmm. Just so many, so many missed opportunities. Yeah, I know. I know. And I mean, it's putting aside the, the politics of it, because I certainly, uh, I, I think that there were incredibly legitimate reasons for, you know, for the people of Russia to rise up and depose, depose them as monarchs. But, you know, putting aside that, the tragedy is this was a family, right? This was a family. These were individuals. And the, the sadness is that there wasn't some way that they could have, they could have survived. And Olga sees that I think earlier than the rest of her family, that, that, uh, that that's not going to happen. No one's coming with a, you know, no one's coming in a ship to save them. And, you know, if they'd just been allowed to live out their lives somewhere, they would have done so quite happily. I, I, I kind of, I think it's, it's pretty clear that that's all they wanted. So, I mean, and it's, this is a story, this is very much a story about the, um, the consequences of war and the consequences of totalitarianism, right? And, and not only are the family are perpetrators of, of that totalitarianism, but they're also the victims in the end, which is such a tragedy. And, and Olga and her siblings are such innocent, like they are the innocents in this. Their parents are not, but they, they certainly were. Well, and I think, um, you know, speaking of totalitarianism, I, you know, just reading this book during this time, you know, with what's happening over in Ukraine. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, you know, the events of your book happened a hundred years ago, but clearly the effects still felt in Russia today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say just the, the revolution just uh, keeps on going or that, that, that what it put in place. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it, it is such a tragedy that, that we're seeing history almost repeating itself, um, you know, with, with Putin in this, in this position where he's just oppressing this whole, you know, this whole community, this whole country of people. And it's, it's, it, you know, as I said, if there's any lesson to draw from this book, it's, it's the consequences of that war. And, and Olga sees it firsthand as a nurse and she obviously is, is, is a victim of it. I, I do have, I do want to say uh, on my website, BrynTurnbull.com, I've got a list of um, charitable organizations that are doing, um, you know, incredible work helping in Ukraine. So if anyone is, is looking for a way to help, um, I've got some, some great organizations on my site that are, uh, that are doing incredible work. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that. It, it's and your website is fabulous too. It's got it's yeah. got all kinds of. Is there anything else you want to mention from your website? Anything? Um, any sources or resources that you'd want to point anybody to that might want to do more research on their own? Yeah. So I mean, one of the things about writing, I I am my favorite part of writing a book is the research. I love 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 researching. And I always get sad when I reach the end of writing a book and I think, where, where, where am I going to put all of this stuff that I know? Where am I going to put all of this knowledge? So my, my website is now the, it's the brain dump for my books after the fact. So I have, uh, I have a page on my website where it's all of these sort of additional, all this additional information. Like I've got a timeline about the Romanovs. Um, you know, I've got different sort of feature featurettes on the different places where they lived and different individuals and I put all of that on the, on my website because otherwise I get very sad that, that it doesn't have anywhere to live. <laughs> so I want to ask you, um, do you think, would there ever be a movie made of this book or of, of the woman before Wallace? Fingers, toes, everything crossed one day. These would become, become it would be a great movie. <laughs> oh, thank you. It really would. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, I find I'm a very visual person. So I write cinematographically, like, like for me, if I can't see it, it's not going to work. So I, I, part of me is like, just somebody pick it up and see, it's already done. It's all there. You just have to like make it real. <laughs> oh, it, it totally is because, you know, whether it was the ballroom with the chandeliers and the tea and the dresses or the, the, the hospital part when they're nursing. And then certainly when the houses that they were, where they were held, I mean, in the snow fort scene, you know, I mean, you can see it while you read it. So and who's, that's really who's wonderful. your cast though? Do you have anyone cast already? <laughs> Who do I have cast? Well, my favorite, like my absolute all-time favorite actor is Florence Pugh. So I, I see her both as Telma 
and also as as Olga. I know that that's I know that's greedy to want her to play both both parts, but that certainly is my she she would be my dream casting for anything. <laughs> oh, another question just came in. Um, if you had a choice to meet either Talma or Olga, who would it be? Oh, great question. Great. That's a really good question. Oh, I can only choose one. Um, honestly, I feel like Telma and I would have a really fun night out. I feel like we would go to like this beautiful cocktail bar. You know, we'd go to the Ritz and we'd order lovely little cocktails and stemmed glasses and gossip madly about Edward. So I, I feel like I'd want to meet her just because I think it would be good stories. Well, it's almost two extremes, right? Sheltered and yes. then out on the town. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Telma lived. <laughs> she lived a life. Telma, Telma could introduce you to some people, I'm sure. Um, so last question before we wrap up. Do you have a title for your next book? Uh, the working title is Avant-Garde uh, because it's all about the degenerate art movement. Uh, well, it wasn't called the degenerate art movement, but it's about the art that Hitler labeled degenerate during the Second World War. Um, so yeah, it's called avant-garde because that was the the kind of art that Hitler really, really despised. And we'll see if that is the title that it, it goes into production with. Not sure. But uh, every all of my books, the titles changed. Every single one. So I'm terrible at writing titles. So... <laughs> We'll see what they, we'll see what, what comes out the other end. So is, is that for later this year or for 2023? 2023. Okay. Yeah. We will look for that. And I have to apologize. I did not turn my dining room light on before. So now I'm progressively getting darker and darker. <laughs> um, I, I look like something from like the Blair Witch Project, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess we're coming to the end of our time. I, I gosh, I could keep going for another hour. It's just so fascinating. But Bryn, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. This has been such a wonderful chat. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks uh, thanks to all the participants for, for coming in and listening. This has been so fun. Oh, good. And thank you, everybody, too, for your great questions. Um, I want to make sure that you know um, a couple things. Um, the first is um, the, the link to the Book and Author Society's um, um, I, I guess if, if you click on this link and you purchase Britain's book, um, what bookshop.org does is it donates a portion of the sale to your local independent bookseller and it donates a, a portion also to the book and author society. So um, if you do that, we will send you a, a book plate that Bryn has signed that you can put in your copy of the last grand duchess or, and um, you can also purchase a copy of the woman before Wallace and we'll send you two. Mm -hmm. So, um, so take advantage of that. And then um, I also want to let you know our next event, um, usually we meet on the third Monday of the month, but next month, April, um, we're going to meet on the second Monday. On April 11th, we will be talking to Jane Green, author of Sister Stardust, um, which is her new book coming out. So we hope you will join us for that. And then in May, um, we have a women's fiction panel coming up with four really fantastic um, women's fiction authors. Lori Foster, Ray Ann Thane, Brenda Novak, and Sarah Morgan will be joining us all the way from England. Um, and then mark your calendars because July 25th is our first live event in over two years. Um, details to be announced, but I can tell you, I can share with you that a beloved Michigan author will be joining us for this live event. So please mark your calendars for April 11th, May 25th, and July 25th. And we hope to see you at all of those. And Bryn, I hope um, when Avant Garde or whatever it's titled, I hope you'll come back and see us and talk again. Oh, you better believe I will. Yay. Thank you, Thank Kathy. You. Thank you, Katie. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We hope you have a great night. Keep reading and make sure you pick up a copy and read The Last Grand Duchess. It'll, it'll, it'll touch your heart. <laughs> have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.